Welcome to Two Messianic Jews. Today, we are discussing how Messianic Jews are perceived by the wider Jewish community. This is something we've been tuning ourselves into for a while now, and we found it helpful to be aware of these perceptions. Not only have we found it helpful to discover what the wider Jewish community thinks of us, but also what the Christian community thinks of us. We will have a future episode discussing Christian perceptions of Messianic Jews as well. Subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified when that is posted. So we are sharing these perceptions with you today, not from a place of being overly concerned about what people think about us, although more on that at the end of the video, but to know how we are being misunderstood by those around us. If we are being misunderstood, then that might mean we are not being understandable. So if that is the case, we need to hear these perceptions and consider how we can communicate who we are and what we believe more clearly. Also, it can be very helpful to hear criticisms and praise from those not in your immediate vicinity. They may be exposing weaknesses that we have trouble noticing. Paying attention to these can help strengthen our community if we take the time to listen. Not only are we sharing these perceptions in order to understand where we need to clarify who we are more effectively, but we also need to be willing to be challenged by where these perceptions may be grounded in a seed of truth. So for this episode, we will first share negative perceptions, then positive, then neutral, and throughout these sections, we're going to be sharing our experiences that we've had and other Messianic people have had with the wider Jewish community. And at the end, Eric and I will give our brief reflections on these perceptions as we consider what we think should be done about these perceptions, how much we should care about them, how we can learn and be strengthened by considering how we are perceived. And these are just a few things that we'll comment on at the end. But for the sake of objectivity, we're going to do our best to simply report our findings in each of these sections with few comments. We just want you to listen to these quotations as news reports, allowing each quotation to speak for itself. And while we disagree with many of the accusations and how the accusations are stated, we will not be disputing with those features in this video. But we will be making a video that, addr that addresses where we disagree in the future. So again, subscribe and hit the notification bell if you would like to join us in exploring these ideas. For now, we're just going to gain a feel for what these perceptions are. And there are a lot of quotations, so we're providing a Word document with the quotations and sources that you'll find in the description. And first a note, when we read these perceptions, it is not always clear who the authors are referring to as Messianic Jews. They'll use terms like Hebrew Christians, or just Christian, or a Jew for Jesus, things like that. And we don't always know if they're referring to people who we would consider as Messianic Jews. So, while these labels are inaccurate to describe Messianic Jews, for the purposes of this video, whenever these labels are being used to describe a Jewish follower of Yeshua, we're considering that a perception of a Messianic Jew. But if you're interested in our own perspective on how Messianic Jew, Messianic Judaism is defined and how it differs from Hebrew Christianity, and how Messianic Jew is not simply a Jew who believes in Jesus, check out our video, Definitions of Messianic Judaism. Okay, with all that, let's jump right into this. All right, so we will start with the negative perceptions. And within the broad category of negative, we found a couple subcategories that were very common uh, in what we were reading. And one of those subcategories is the perception that Messianic Jews are being deceptive. And one of the examples I found of a Jewish leader espousing this perception is Rabbi David Wolpe of Sinai Temple in Los Angeles. And in a Times of Israel article, this is uh, what he's quoted to be saying. It is dishonest, deliberately or inadvertently, to say that one can live in a Jewish faith community and accept another scripture or accept a different God. It's striking that for thousands of years, the definition of being Christian was believing in Jesus, and all of a sudden they've discovered, no, you can do that and be Jewish. It is, whether they realize it or not, a marketing tool, not a discovery. And as the Reconstructionist rabbi and scholar Dr. Carol Harris Shapiro, she notes this. She says, American Jews, for the most part, consider Messianic Jews not only traitors for leaving the fold, but also liars for claiming they are Jewish, not Christian. So, as you'll notice throughout this presentation, we'll be quoting a lot of scholars, a lot of journalists, a lot of people like that. But I wanted to kind of try my best to get a feel and hear from people who are just who I would presume to be just common, everyday Jewish people. 
And so I went on to a very popular website. It's called Reddit, where it's just a bunch of forums where you can pose questions and, and people answer. So I found one of the sub forums that's concerning Judaism. And so I just asked, what is your perception of Messianic Jews? And one of the Reddit users said this. Former Messianic Jew here. They may wear kippot, tzitzit, albeit on their belt loops a lot of the time, and bekala, but they are about as theologically Jewish as bacon-wrapped shrimp. The Messianic movement was developed in the 70s as a way to make Christianity more palatable to Jews. Though many are genuine in their efforts, their approach to evangelism is a cultural bait and switch. They aim to use Jewish imagery and symbolism to bring in lapsed yet spiritually hungry Jews with familiar Jewish elements and get them to embrace what is essentially fundamentalist Christian theology. So again, I just thought this was a, a good one to include because it is who I presume to be just a common everyday Jewish person who also shares these views of, you know, of scholars, rabbis, journalists that we're quoting. Right. And Rabbi Bensian Kravitz, who is the founder of the counter-missionary organization Jews for Judaism, this is the way he describes Messianic Jews. He calls them Hebrew Christian, and he says, Numerous Hebrew Christian leaders dishonestly refer to themselves as rabbis and to their places of worship as synagogues. These tactics are employed in an attempt to render their version of Christianity more palatable to the Jews they seek to convert. So what we see this is very, uh, this, this is a common idea that Messianic Judaism is created to make uh, Christianity more palatable for the Jew. And also we see that in 1993, the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York, they issued a statement on Messianic Judaism, which, which they called Hebrew Christianity. And this was included in their statement. Though Hebrew Christianity claims to be a form of Judaism, it is not. It is nothing more than a disguised effort to missionize Jews and convert them to Christianity. It deceptively uses the sacred symbols of Jewish observance, i.e. community Passover seders, menorahs, messianic services, as a cover to convert Jews to Christianity, a belief system antithetical to Judaism. So these are the quotations we have for you that messianic Jews are perceived as deceptive. And now we're going to move on to quotations of perceptions that were not even Jews. So the first example I want to give to you is, again, from Rabbi Bensian Kravitz, and he says this, One thing upon which the entire Jewish community and several Christian denominations agree is that Hebrew Christian movements are not part of Judaism. To be a Jew for Jesus is as absurd as being a Christian for Buddha and as ridiculous as kosher pork. It is an obvious contradiction. To paraphrase Elijah, if you are a follower of Jesus, call yourself a Christian. If you're a Jew, practice Judaism. Don't deceive yourselves. You can't be both. Kravitz went on to explain this. He says a Jew who follows another religion is Jewish only to the point that he retains a spiritual obligation to repent and return to Judaism. However, as long as his beliefs are idolatrous and foreign to Judaism, he cannot call himself a Jew. And then we return to Rabbi David Wolpe, where he explained this recently. A Jew who accepts Jesus has cut himself off from the faith community of Jews, and that has been so for 2,000 years. The sudden rise of Messianic Jews owes more to a clever way of misleading untutored Jews than to making theological sense. Another person I want to quote is Dr. Patricia Power. Now, she teaches at Arizona State University, and she is an expert in Messianic Judaism. I'm not sure what her religious background is, but this is her field of study. And this is what she says. In no uncertain terms, as far as the main institutions of modern American Judaism are concerned, to be a Christian is not to be a Jew, and to be a Jew is, at the very least, not to be a Christian. And then we have Lionel Koplowitz. He's the president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, and he gives a perception that many Jewish leaders commonly hold. And he says this, It is a fallacy to suggest that one can be both a Jew and a Christian. Throughout history, those who have become converted to Christianity have immediately or after a lapse of time ceased to be Jewish. So now we're going to move on to the category of quotations that were perceived as not part of the Jewish community. And so the first quotation I want to share with you is from the Central Conference of American Rabbis, Response to 68, from September of 1983. 
And this explains Reforms Judaism's position on Messianic Judaism. This is what it says. It is not the individual who defines whether she is Jewish, but the group. For us in the Jewish community, anyone who claims that Jesus is their Savior is no longer a Jew and is an apostate. Through that belief, she has placed herself outside the Jewish community. Whether she cares to define herself as a Christian or as a fulfilled Jew, Messianic Jew, or any other designation is irrelevant. To us, she clearly is a Christian. We should therefore consider a completed Jew as an apostate. Such individuals should not be accorded membership in the congregation or treated in any way which makes them appear as if they were affiliated with the Jewish community, for that poses a clear danger to the Jewish community and also to its relationships with the general community. And then we have a similar statement coming from the conservative Jewish movement, and this statement is approved by the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards uh, within conservative Judaism, and this was approved in October of 2012, and it says this, A Jew becoming a Christian is an apostate, and whatever laws apply to an apostate apply to a Messianic Jew. In essence, Messianic Jews have become Christians. Even if technically they remain Jews in certain matters of personal status, synagogue membership is only for Jews. Therefore, since Messianic Jews have become Christians in their religious belief and affiliation, they may not be accepted as members in our congregations. They may not receive synagogue honors or participate in Jewish rituals. Messianic Jews may not receive a Jewish burial or be buried in a Jewish cemetery. And going back to the 1993 statement by the Jewish Community Council of New York, they wrote the following in their introduction to their statement. This is what they said. Jewish religious leadership has unequivocally declared Hebrew Christians as completely separate and disassociated from the Jewish community. This statement has been endorsed by the four major Jewish denominations, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, and Reconstructionists, as well as national Jewish organizations. So now we're going to move on to the perceptions that Messianic Jews hold un-Jewish beliefs. And the first quotation I want to share with you is from the Jewish theologian David Novak. He says, The Christhood, incarnation, Trinitarian status of Jesus of Nazareth is not an option within God's everlasting covenant with the people of Israel. Jewish Christians are still Jews, but they are no longer practicing a religion Jews regard as part of Judaism. And the counter-missionary organization Jews for Judaism's rabbi Michael Skobek, he says this, We know that in Judaism, a person that's born a Jew remains a Jew regardless of what they do. So when a Jewish person converts to Christianity, they still remain a Jew. That's not in question. The question is, is what they're doing Jewish? Meaning, is what they're doing consistent with the teachings of Judaism? And he goes on to say, Christianity is not consistent with the teachings of Judaism. And I just want to say that we will be making a video on this specific perspective Rabbi Skobek promotes, so subscribe to get access to the video when it comes out. What we make of his idea here, it, it might surprise you. So then I went to a website called Jewish Values Online, where people can post questions, and the curators of the website, they gather answers from rabbis from all the different branches of Judaism, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, and so on in order to kind of give a representation of what the whole community thinks about whatever question is being posed. And so one of the questions that's being asked on this website is, what are the differences between Orthodox, Reform, Conservative, and Messianics? And here is the answer offered by Reform Rabbi Joseph Blair. He says, simply put, Orthodox, Reform, Conservative, and Reconstructionist, Renewal, and multiple other groups are Jewish, accepted within the bounds of Judaism, and include only those who do not worship Jesus and are not Christians. Messianics, or Jews for Jesus, so-called completed Jews, and others with various names, are simply not Jewish. They are not accepted as Jews and never will be. They are Christians who worship Jesus. The two faiths are completely incompatible. One cannot hold both and be faithful to either. Anyone claiming otherwise is either completely deluded himself or attempting to deceive others. So as I mentioned, what typically happens on this website is that many different perspectives are gathered from all the different branches of Judaism. 
but the administrator for this particular web page makes a very interesting note, and they say this. Since this is not a matter of conjecture or opinion, but is universally accepted in the Jewish world, and this is not an ethical, moral values, or proper behavior subject, this is the only response this question or any like it will receive. No further questions regarding this topic will appear on the Jewish Values Online website. So I just thought it was interesting that the administrator for this particular web page thought that the answer given by Rabbi Joseph Blair just answered it all, gave it all as far as what the Jewish community thinks of Messianic Jews. As we'll see later on, that's not necessarily the case. But on this website where multiple perspectives are usually received, the administrator didn't think that was necessary for this particular question. And I want to share an experience that I had while I was an undergrad. And during this time, the Jewish barbecue was going to happen at the local Chabad rabbi's house, the campus Chabad rabbi. And he called me over to tell me that you're welcome to come to the Jewish barbecue because, you know, you're you're Jewish. I know that your, your parents are Jewish. You're Jewish. Uh, but you can't let anyone know what you believe. You can't let anyone know that you're a Messianic Jew. Now, this was, this was interesting. So he's, he's saying, yeah, I'm born a Jew. He can't change that. But what he wanted to tell me was that my beliefs are not Jewish. So don't let anyone know what you believe. I even asked him, like, what if someone asked me what I believe? What if someone asked me where, you know, I go to services? What do I tell them? He says, don't answer their question. And so what I saw from this is that he didn't want to give any legitimacy. This is what I think was happening. He didn't want to give any legitimacy to Messianic Judaism as Jewish, but he can't stop me from going to the barbecue because, yeah, I'm, I'm born a Jew. And that's just an experience that I had that I think is really uh, representative of the kinds of ideas that we're giving you here in these quotations that, yeah, you could be a Jew, you're born a Jew, but your beliefs aren't Jewish and um, this has implications for how you're going to interact with within our Jewish community. Yeah, and the rabbi actually pulled me aside, and I had the exact same conversation with him, so that was a very interesting engagement for sure. And so we not only wanted to pull in our own experiences, but we found a couple of surveys that uh, we'll talk about now and then later on where we talk about uh, experiences of Messianic Jews all over for this study, America, and then later on, we'll talk about in Israel. And so this is a survey and a study done by Jews for Jesus. It's called a Profile of North American Messianic Jews. And the part that I want to highlight is the observation that the researchers made between uh, how older Messianic Jews, so people in uh, the above 50 group, had more negative experiences than those younger of course, there was still some negative experienced by the younger, but they said that it kind of clustered in the above 50 age group. And so a couple different types of rejection that uh, the Messianic Jews were experiencing in the survey uh, was direct rejection by their family and then fear of telling family just period. And so here are just a few quotations from each one of those categories uh, from Messianic Jews who responded to the survey. And so regarding direct rejection from their family, here's a couple quotations. The first one, when I first went to church, mom kicked me out of the house and made me choose to either leave church or leave the house. The next one, since I come from a very powerful family, I was concerned they would try to have my children taken out of my care through legal channels, but I was prepared to face any judge since freedom of religion is our right. And then here's the next one, my family cut me off and mourned my death they wanted nothing to do with me for a while. Then after eight months or so, they accepted it, but not happily. And then here's a couple people who were just afraid of telling their family just in the first place. One said, I had a huge fear of my dad finding out. And another said, I was afraid to tell my parents and my family members. And so here is a quotation from the study uh, about this observation. And they said, these qualitative results show that the older group of Messianic Jews experienced quite a bit more external pressure than younger respondents. And this is just important to highlight because Jonathan will be discussing it later on near the end of the video. So we have found that we're perceived as deceptive, not Jewish, outside the Jewish community, and hold un-Jewish beliefs. 
These are the common perceptions. But while gathering these sources, we also found that there are some more highly negative perceptions that about Messianic Jews that are less common, but I think they're worth sharing. So I'm going to start with a quotation from Rabbi Arya Kaplan, who wrote a book called The Real Messiah, A Jewish Response to Missionaries in 1976. This is what he said. A Jew who accepts Christianity is no longer a Jew and can no longer be counted as part of a Jewish congregation. Conversion to another faith is an act of religious treason. It is one of the worst possible sins that a Jew can commit, along with murder and incest. It is one of the three cardinal sins which may not be violated even under pain of death. A Jew must give his life rather than embrace Christianity. Now I want to share with you a quotation from Rabbi Shmuley Bateach, who was on a TV show, and on the show he was on a panel with Christian leaders and a Messianic Jew named Dr. Richard Harvey, which we've spoken about on another video. And during the panel discussion, there was a moment where Richard Harvey and Rabbi Bateach were in a discussion between another. They were in a debate. And Shmuley Bateach was asking Dr. Harvey about his view about salvation of Jews and whether they need Jesus. And during the discussion, this is a response that Boteach gave to Richard Harvey. He said, you, my friend, are a spiritual Nazi. Now, this is really strong language to someone who lost family members in the Holocaust. And Dr. Harvey let Rabbi Boteach know that. But this is the kind of reaction, this is the kind of highly negative perceptions that uh, Messianic Jews receive, that even calling us um, spiritual Nazis. And now I would like to go over an article written by Leah Bendel. Uh, the title of her article is, How Has the Image of Messianic Jews in Israel Changed in the Last 37 Years? And she wrote this in 2016. So I'll just share a few quotations from her article with you. In 2011, Rabbi Yosef Shainan of Ashdod compared Messianic Jews to Hitler, saying that both wanted a final solution. Yet the believers today do not have the instruments of destruction, so they are using those of apostasy. The rabbi warns that if Messianic Jews are not finished off, the city will be harmed in the most dangerous way. In the wake of a Messianic conference in 2015, the rabbi of the Old City, Rabbi Avigdor Levensel, and Daniel Lasor, a former Christian, allied in the fight against the Messianic cults and called their actions a modern crusade and a final solution for people's souls. The anti-missionaries hoped that the public would realize the hate beneath the love. So then Leah Bendel remarks on the local public perceptions of people like Rabbi Shainan, and she says this, When Rabbi Yosef Shainan compared Messianic Jews to Hitler, another newspaper conducted a poll to determine readers' attitudes toward Shainan's comment. The most prominent opinion was that it is a shame for Ashdod that taxpayers' money is funding Rabbi Yosef. And so those are the highly negative perceptions that we found. And then in addition to the highly negative perceptions, we found cases of physical violence, primarily in Israel. And so returning to Leah Bendel's article, here's a few more accounts that she shares. She says, after having suffered a lot of intimidation and harassment in the previous years, the Messianic community in Arad wrote an open letter to Atan Hatzvi in 2005 to ask the general public not to turn a blind eye to threats by the ultra-Orthodox community as this is not appropriate for a democratic state. The extent of harassment ranges from insults and curses, threatening children, and spitting on Bibles to the destruction of personal property. One month later, the chess club belonging to the Messianic Jewish congregation, went up in flames in an arson attack. Tanakhs and other holy scriptures were burned. The police found writing on the wall. The members spoke of a miracle that no one was in the building when the attack happened. Out of fear of being assaulted in their private homes, the leadership did not want their names to be published. Nevertheless, the believers stand firm as these acts only strengthen our faith in Yeshua the Messiah, who will bring justice to the light. She goes on to say that in March 2008, a 15-year-old Messianic believer survived an attempted assassination by parcel bomb. Amiel Ortiz, son of congregational leader David Ortiz in Ariel, opened a package that was delivered to their home, and it exploded right in front of him. Investigations show that it was a personal attack on the family, as they are Messianic believers. On June 29, 2016, the Jewish terrorist Yaakov Titel 
was judged to be sane and sentenced to two life terms plus an additional 30 years in prison and the payment of compensation to his victims or the families of murder victims. Titel stated that he did not have any regrets and that he is proud of his deeds. Bendel goes on to say that in response to attacks against Messianic Jews, Yad Lachim's Shalom Dov Lipschitz justified violence contrary to previous statements. Quote, it's not natural that there won't be violence. Look, according to what they've done to us, we should kill a Christian every day. No? Yeah, so a lot of these uh, occurrences of violence in Israel are either attributed to or claimed to be done by groups like Yad Lachim or another one called Lehava. And Bendel, she provides a perception of these groups given by a journalist for the Jerusalem Post. His name is Larry Durfner. He investigated the Messianic Jewish faith on his own in 2009. According to Bendel, Durfner condemned Yad Lachim's attempts to try, quote, everything legally possible to make these people's lives miserable from publishing personal details of believers in newspapers to calling employers and urging them to fire Messianic Jews to contacting the Interior Ministry to prevent members receiving citizenship and its benefits. So thankfully, the public reception of this group in Israel is largely negative, but the attitude of the leaders in this group is worth being aware of because of how extreme it is and those who are following the leadership so even though this is the minority, we felt it was important to share with you. All right, so we made it through the negative perceptions, and now we will move to the neutral perceptions of Messianic Jews. And by neutral, we mean that in these quotations, there's some negative language, but they also contain some positive aspects. So we will start with Reconstructionist rabbi and scholar, Dr. Carol Harris Shapiro, and she says this, However, unlike apostates of ages past, Messianic Jews enthusiastically embrace a form of Jewish identity. They are careful to inculcate this identity in Messianic synagogue, home, and day school. They claim solidarity with Israel and Jews worldwide. They are still loyal to the Jewish community. They assert it is the Jewish community that has summarily rejected them. And to quote another scholar, an Orthodox Jew named Dr. Zeb Garber, he wrote a book in 2019 called Judaism and Jesus. And this is what he said. Messianic and Rabbinite Jews are united by God, Torah, Israel, people, and land. They differ in biblical exegesis, understanding and application of halakha, fulfillment of prophecy, role of Messiah, Messianic age, resurrection of the dead, and life immortal. Christology and or Jesusolatry testify to conflicting, not converging forms of Judaism. And then to return to Bendel, she gives a snapshot of what is currently the kind of general societal perspective of Messianic Jews in Israel. And she says this, There is no unanimous perspective on Messianic Jews in Israel. Some journalists write in favor, or at least are unbiased about believers, some write in a rather inflammatory style. The opinions of neighbors, police officers, and members of the Knesset have varied over the years and always depend on the case. And going on with Leah Bendel's work, she says, Larry Durfner, his verdict is this. The community cannot be considered a cult because of the lack of a single leader. And there is no brainwashing of new converts who are also not being kept away from family and friends. Quote, anyone who wants to leave the community leaves. And then we return to our friends on Reddit, and I got a few different answers, and I think these do a really good job of not only giving a neutral perception, but what is honestly probably the most common perception of Messianic Jews as well. And so one Reddit user by the username of the guy with the balloon, he says, I tend not to think of them. And when we just kind of take a step back, this is very largely likely the case for most Jewish people. Messianic Jews are not at the forefront of their mind. And then another Reddit user by the name of Sparky Felix, he says, if they're actually Jewish, then they're Jewish. If they're not, they're not. Unless they prove otherwise, I'll assume they're good people too. Regardless, they're very misguided and wrong. So Sparky Felix, though he thinks, you know, we're incorrect in our conclusions, at least he assumes that we are living our lives with good intent and doing what we do with good intent. 
which is a step up, especially compared to uh, the quotations we were going over and the negative perceptions. So those were the neutral perceptions that we found, and now we'll move on to the positive perceptions that we found. And so we would like to start with a survey done by the Pew Research Center in 2013, and one of their conclusions was this. 34% of American Jews say belief in Jesus as the Messiah is compatible with being Jewish. And so then commenting on the Pew survey is Sarah Benin Benor. She's a professor at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, and she acted as an advisor on this Pew study, and she comments on this particular observation. She says, it points to the blurring boundaries between Jews and non-Jews. More people than in the past believe that you can be both Jewish and Christian. And to give Bendel's conclusions, here is what she says. It is agreed that there is growing persecution from the ultra-Orthodox sector, anti-missionary demonstrations, verbal and physical attacks, incitement, the list goes on and on. However, by analyzing the newspaper reports on Messianic believers in Israel from 1979 to 2016, a positive change can be observed in the media. A shift took place from merely reporting myths about strange sect of Jewish believers in Yeshua to actually interviewing Messianic believers and letting them explain their faith themselves. On several occasions, Messianic ministries and congregations publish advertisements in Israel's newspapers. TV channels ask Messianic Jews about their beliefs in their programs. Journalists and other public figures condemned the attacks and called for justice in this democratic country. The public appears to empathize more and to recognize the injustice experienced by Messianic Jews at the hands of ultra-Orthodox extremists and strict governmental regulations regarding the recognition of their status as Jews. Overall, public opinion on Messianic Jews in Israel is quite positive. The main non-religious newspapers present them in a mostly unbiased and affirmative way. Therefore, Messianic believers, both Jews and Gentiles who are part of the family, can be encouraged by the upward trend in media reports. After reading all these negative perceptions, I think it's encouraging to see that at the very least, the Israeli media is taking an interest in hearing from Messianic Jews, letting them speak for themselves, and the public opinion of Messianic Jews in Israel is, as Bendel puts, quite positive. And a Messianic Jewish friend of mine who lives in Israel confirmed that from her experience, your average Israeli doesn't have too much of a problem with her being a Messianic Jew. This highly negative pushback against Messianic Jews comes mostly from counter-missionaries, the ultra-Orthodox, and governmental authorities. And as we were gathering these positive perceptions, we noticed that a lot of these authors and thinkers, they had a positive perception because they were really desiring consistency regarding what it means to be a Jewish person in the modern world. And so to start off with these types of perceptions, here's a quote from Rabbi Dr. Dan Cohn Sherbach from his book Messianic Judaism, which he wrote in 2000. He says this, Rather than engaging in bitter and acrimonious criticism of one another's religious viewpoints, the Jewish people need a new framework for harmonious living, one which will serve as a remedy for the bitter divisions that have split the community into warring factions since the Enlightenment. On the principle that it is always better to listen to people than to spit on them, the pluralists argue for an open model. In accordance with this, the seven-branched menorah in which all denominations, including Messianic Judaism, are represented, is the only reasonable starting point for inter-community relations in the 21st century. And again, to quote from Dr. Carol Harris Shapiro, she said this in her book, Messianic Judaism, A Rabbi's Journey Through Religious Change in America, which was published in 1999. She says, the present day Jewish community contains a goodly number of heretics from one Jewish perspective or another. If one were to follow the great rabbi and philosopher Maimonides' definition, anyone who could not affirm one of his 13 articles of faith, such as the resurrection of the dead, would be excluded from the Jewish community. If one were to follow the commonly accepted, pre-modern definition, anyone who violates the Sabbath publicly is considered an ideological, deliberate heretic, and is not to be counted in the community of Israel. Both definitions would neatly decimate the American Jewish population. Given the cost, it is not surprising that American Jews of all movements are loath to clearly identify boundary crossers. 
The exception, of course, is the Messianic Jews. The Jewish community is uniquely united in their condemnation of Messianic Judaism. The traditional allowances made by Orthodox Jews are not extended to Messianic Jews. Unlike liberal Jews, Messianic Jews are not considered as captive children, unintentionally violating Judaism. The core value of freedom of thought held by liberal Jews that enables them to accept secular Jews or Jews incorporating Eastern practices stops cold at Messianic Jewish theology. A Jew can believe almost anything but Jesus as Lord. And then from her article, Messianic Jews as Mirror, in 1994, Dr. Carol Harris Shapiro also says this, Our clinging to this boundary, firm for 1,500 years, is often done less for theological reasons than for sociological ones. It is a disservice to Judaism to maintain our distinction from Christianity only because of what has become a knee-jerk taboo. To know one is a Jew only because one is not a Christian is a terribly weak and hollow form of Jewishness. Also to quote from an Orthodox Jewish author, in an article published by The Forward called Are We Being Fair to Messianic Jews? And this is an American Jewish news source. He says, Many Jews criticize Messianic spokesmen for blurring the distinction between Judaism and Christianity. But is this any different from mainstream Jewish leaders who, on issues ranging from homosexuality to abortion and euthanasia, blur the equally sharp divide between traditional Jewish values and the values of secular liberalism? Ah, you say Messianic Judaism is deceptive in doing this. Well, no more so than those Jewish groups that campaign for gay rights while disguising the fact that Jewish scripture unambiguously forbids homosexual intercourse, Leviticus 18.22. Later in his article, Klinghoffer says, In his encyclopedic Mishnah Torah, Maimonides lists 24 categories of people who may forfeit eternal life. One is a Jew who attributes bodily form to God. One is a Jew who believes in multiple deities. Another is one who denies that even a single word in the Torah comes from God. To revile Messianic Judaism while embracing Jewish movements that deny the revelation of the Torah at Sinai then makes little sense. Later in the article, Klinghoffer says, There is a further practical objection to Messianic Judaism. One may reasonably argue that Jewish belief in Jesus acts as a corrosive, an acid upon Jewish existence. There has never been a viable Jewish Christianity that didn't ultimately disappear into the Gentile world. Yet secularism has done a better job of decimating our ranks than has any other religion, and you don't hear many Jews speaking out against secularism. And then another article in the foreword written by Josh Nathan Katsis. He is describing the view of Rabbi Yichel Eckstein. He was the founder of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. And according to Katsis, Rabbi Eckstein downplayed the contradiction between traditional Judaism and the idea of Jesus as the Messiah. He goes on to say this, Jesus as Messiah is not a foreign concept at all, Eckstein said. Traditional Jews believe in the concept of the Messiah, Eckstein argued, just not in Jesus himself having been the Messiah. After all, Eckstein said, Jews don't reject as not Jewish members of the Chabad Hasidic sect who believe that their dead Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, was the Messiah. We disagree with them fundamentally, but we still incorporate them as part of the Jewish people, Eckstein said of Chabad Messianists. And we also have positive perceptions of Messianic Jews in that they are good Israeli citizens. One example comes from Ron Campius, who is a writer for the Times of Israel, and in 2013, he wrote, an, he wrote an article called, Has the Time Come to Accept Messianic Jews? And he says this, Despite their rejection by mainstream Jewry, Messianic Jews are not entirely outside the tent. Jewish security professionals also reach out to Messianic congregations in cases of perceived security threats against the Jewish community. According to the Secure Community Network, the security arm of national Jewish groups. And then here's a quotation from Haaretz. They are a Jewish publication, and we got this quotation from Bendel's article. So Haaretz says this, As it became more and more general knowledge that anti-missionary organizations work together with the Ministry of Interior, which is a branch of the Israeli government, further articles arose that reveal the injustice faced by Messianic believers. They serve in the army, educate their children according to the values of the state and Zionism, send them to regular schools, work for their living, 
mostly in the free professions, pay taxes, love the state, swear loyalty to it, and are dedicated to it, but despite all this, feel like a persecuted minority. And then just to give a little bit of context for this, in Israel, the ultra-Orthodox community gets a lot of flack for not participating in the army and in greater society, and so when Messianic Jews are doing these things, the wider Israeli community responds very well. All right, so we have made it through the negative, the neutral, and the positive perceptions of the wider Jewish community of Messianic Jews. And so then the question becomes, what should we, as the Messianic community, do with these perceptions? And so to close it out, I will talk about the negative perceptions, and Jonathan will talk about the positive perceptions. All right. So how seriously should we take the criticisms? Personally, I think we should care a little bit about them. But at the end of the day, we need to be more concerned about figuring ourselves out, dealing with our own questions and problems, and holding ourselves more accountable to God than to what people think. This is because, as was shown by our survey of perceptions, that there is a wide array of opinions, and people's opinions constantly change. If we put too much stock in the opinions of others, we are putting too much stock in things that can change on a moment's notice. There will always be people who don't like us. There will always be people who are apathetic. There will always be people who understand us and accept us. The amount of each kind of person and how loud they are about it will be in constant flux. That said, the things we hear about ourselves from others should not be totally ignored. We need to be aware of the possibility of physical violence and be prepared but do not become paranoid because it is such a minority of people who will take it that far. Accusations of us being Nazis who desire a final solution are absolutely ridiculous and untrue. But let's take a moment to try to figure out why they might be thinking these things. Could it be that they are remembering how the Christian church forced Jews to convert and abandon their Jewishness for much of Christian history? This resulted in the disappearance of many Jewish family lines. With this, they are convinced Messianic Judaism is just Christianity hiding underneath the Jewish cloak. I understand their fears. They think we are effectively cutting off lines of Jewish lineage, just as was done by the Christian church during the Middle Ages. This misunderstanding is especially disheartening because Messianic Judaism is trying to do the exact opposite. We are attempting to reverse the effect belief in Jesus has had during many centuries of Christian history. Before Messianic Judaism and after the advent of Christendom, becoming a member of the Christian church did require a neglect of your Jewish identity. But with Messianic Judaism, following Yeshua is a reason to be more invested and more proud of your Jewish identity, and to feel strongly about passing our strong sense of Jewish identity onto the generations following us. There will be Jews who decide to follow Yeshua. If these Jewish leaders, who are incredibly concerned about Jewish continuity, understand we are attempting to maintain and celebrate Jewish continuity, it would be really difficult to call us Nazis. Hopefully soon, those who think Messianic Judaism is a threat to Jewish continuity recognize it is a remedy to what has historically been a major problem for Jewish continuity. All right, so moving on to accusations of being deceptive. When we hear constant and consistent accusations of being deceiving, we need to examine ourselves. What are our motivations for doing what we do? Do we only wear a kippah and use Hebrew terms to create witnessing opportunities? Do we only observe the feasts and keep kosher to become a Jew to the Jews? Most Messianic Jews I know are faithful to Yeshua and cultivate their Jewish identity because they feel both are their duty before God. But I am aware of some individuals who seemingly have more shallow motives. For those individuals, I think these complaints need to be heard very loud and clear. For one, these complaints show that as a witnessing strategy, this is offensive and tone deaf. Adopting a Jewish way of life for no other reason than to make the gospel more palatable to Jewish people is different from a Christian missionary going to a remote island that has never heard the gospel and learns their culture and their language in order to share with them about Jesus. Those living on this remote island do not have the same history with the Christian church as the Jewish people do. The remote islanders in this example were not persecuted and subjugated 
by the Christian church for over 1,500 years. This remote culture has no prior perception of the gospel as a message that eliminates God's promises to Israel and erases Jewish identity. This remote culture was never killed in the name of Jesus. This is the message and the experience Jewish people have had for centuries, and this is what they think that believing in Jesus entails. So when Jewish people have such a pre-existing conception of the gospel and then discover you only behave like them to share what is historically a threatening message, they are understandably offended by it. Of course, we would condemn the version of the gospel Jews heard during much of Christian history. But until we are understandable in what our message as Messianic Jews is, Jewish people will import much of Christian history onto our shoulders and assume ill intent. Second, Adopting a Jewish way of life for no other reason than to get Jewish people to talk to you is likely based on a gross misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23. This is something we will address more fully in a later episode, but, to be blunt, doing Jewish things that you would otherwise not do for no other reason than to share the gospel is a poor representation of Paul's heart for his Jewish brothers and sisters and his instruction to his believing communities. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2, he says this, For this reason, since we have this ministry, just as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. Instead, we renounce the hidden shameful ways, not walking in deception or distorting the word of God, but commending ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by the open proclamation of the truth. Pair this with 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, where Paul says, for our urging is not out of deceit, or impure motives, or trickery. An interpretation of 1 Corinthians 9 that suggests Paul does the very things he condemns in these other passages is clearly not a good interpretation. But like I said, we will cover this issue more in depth later on. Adopting Jewish practices for no other reason than to share the gospel with Jews only justifies their accusations of deception. We Messianic Jews recognize we need no other motivation to live out our Jewish identity than the fact we are Jews and God expects us to remain Jews. That said, I do think many of these complaints of deception are based mostly on past history. As we discussed in our video Definitions of Messianic Judaism, Messianic Judaism evolved from Hebrew Christianity, which was purely missionary strategies to get Jews to become Christians. But Messian Judaism emphatically insisted that that was not the proper orientation for Jewish followers of Yeshua. Messian Judaism seeks to become an authentic Jewish home for Jewish followers of Yeshua. So as time goes by and Messian Judaism continues to distance itself from Hebrew Christianity, I think these accusations of deception will decrease as well. So again, while we cannot let negative perceptions dictate how we live our lives before God and in our community, it is worth thinking about what value we can gain by carefully considering the criticisms. This can help remind us to check ourselves and make corrections which can lead to a healthier and stronger Messianic community moving forward. Absolutely. That's really well said, Eric. And as we have seen, many in the Jewish community call us deceptive and see us as Christians disguised in Jewish clothes. Many think we're attempting to get Jews to embrace Christianity through any means possible, even to the point of lying about our religious identity and our places of worship. What needs to be made clear is this. Messianic Judaism is not a missionary strategy. We as Jews have a covenantal responsibility to continue living as Jews as we follow Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel. I think once we clearly declare that one of the main messages of Messianic Judaism is that following Yeshua as the Messiah and being proud of your Jewish identity are inseparable, the more we will be understood. The more I've learned about Yeshua, Paul, and the teachings of the New Testament, I've become even more proud and invested in my Jewish identity than I already was. Once we're able to communicate to others that this is genuinely our experience, the more we will be received positively by the wider Jewish community. When we fail to engage in productive conversations with Jews from this wider Jewish community, stereotypes and caricatures can be created on both sides, and we can easily be misunderstood. And, you know, many talk about Jewish-Christian relations, and 
that is healing between Christians and Jews through interfaith dialogue. And I think that's absolutely important. But what I also think is important and what we should start talking about is Jewish-Jewish relations. That is Messianic Jews, Orthodox Jews, Conservative Jews, Reformed Jews, Secular. All of us need to be dialoguing. Healing and better communication needs to be made within our Jewish community. And I think the second and 11th principles in our guidelines for tough conversations are extremely relevant to how Messianic and non-Messianic Jews should interact. And these are seek to understand before being understood and state what you believe as precisely as possible. The only way to be understood is to be understandable. And I've been attending Messiah Conference for a number of years, and honestly, one of the things I look forward to most is going down to the Jews for Judaism tent at the entrance to the campus of Messiah College. For decades, this counter-missionary organization comes to Messiah Conference, at least at the entrance, with the goal of bringing Messianic Jews out of Messianic Judaism. And the tent has been seen by, by some as these enemies protesting our conference. And historically, there's been a lot of hostile debates down there on both sides. But what I do and what Eric does is we, we go down to the tent and make an effort whenever possible to have conversations, to have productive conversations with these counter missionaries. And I can tell you from ex my own experience that these actually have been productive. They've been enjoyable. We do our best to hear where they're coming from. We ask questions, explain why we're Messianic Jews. And I usually begin my discussions with them by saying, this is why I'm a Messianic Jew, but I would give up my faith if you could show me why I should. You know, I say I value truth more than being right. And I find that this is a great way to start a conversation, letting them know that I'm here for truth. And I actually care about what they have to say. I actually care about what you have to say. And last year, I even asked a counter missionary who has been coming to the tent for literally decades, every year being at the same spot for decades. I asked him, you know, after, after having just hours of conversation with him, I said, you know, why do you come every year? Like, why have you been coming so often? What, what, what motivates you to be here? And the response he gave me was, I care about my people. And that, I think that was, that was really good to hear. And I, I thanked him for that. I thanked him for coming because he comes because he honestly cares about me and Messianic Jews enough to tell, to tell us why he thinks we're wrong and why he thinks we should come back to Judaism, why we should be faithful to Judaism and the God of Israel. And this gives me the opportunity to tell him that I have the same, I, I have the same goal. I want to tell him that I care about remaining faithful to Judaism and to the God of Israel and that I do that through my belief in Yeshua as the Messiah. So we differ there, but we both, I have an opportunity to explain to him that I care about the same things he cares about, to be faithful to the God of Israel and to be faithful to Judaism. And through the conversation, we're, we can be better understood. And I, I've seen that. I think that after having all these conversations with them, with, I mean, Eric and I, you can maybe testify to this too. I, I think um, we've actually been able to be in better communication with those who many times are seen as enemies. And to give another example of this Jewish-Jewish dialogue I'm talking about, during this past year's Messianic Jewish Academic Conference called the Borough Park Symposium, the topic was on the Jewishness of Jesus and Paul. And this was a unique conference in that it, it was a Messianic conference that brought together both Messianic and non-Messianic Jewish scholars to discuss these very issues. And one of the presenters was a Jewish New Testament scholar named Dr. Amy Jill Levine, who teaches at Vanderbilt University. And these are the comments she made at the conference that I think shows the benefit of such a Jewish-Jewish dialogue. This is what she said. Rabbi Dr. Kinzer is right when he sees Messianic Jews as part of the Jewish people in the New Testament times. And as far as I can tell from a halakhic position, Messianic Jews have always been Jews. Nothing somehow changed in the year 70 or 135 or 200 or whatever. While many people today have a problem with hybridity and would like to place people into neat categories, just be a Jew or be a Christian, that's not the way the world works. The world is a messy and splendid place. Personally, I would rather have Jews who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior to con continue to claim their Jewish identity and indeed to be recognized as Jews by other Jews rather than have Messianic Jews simply become Baptists or Roman Catholics or Episcopalians or Presbyterians or whatever 
And I would rather have their children know their Jewish identity as a living tradition rather than just a genetic marker. I think that's right, and I think Luke would agree. Well, because that's right. I think we non-Messianic Jews, here I'm speaking for the, the rest of the mishpacha, I think we non-Messianic Jews should do more in welcoming our family members who proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. Why? Um, not only is it halakhically appropriate, it's an ethical issue. I have f seen far too many instances where Jewish families have become dismembered because one member has become Messianic, and I think that's awful. To me, halakhically, the child of a Jewish parent, or at least the mother, is a Jew, and believing in Jesus does not change that essential definition. So we Jews need to do something about this broken family relationship. That I agree. So when it comes to these encouraging comments of acceptance, like Dr. Levine's comments here and others that we've mentioned, I think we should be encouraged. These are confirmations that we have made progress in communicating who we are and behaving in such a way that honors the Lord. This shows that once we are understood, there are not good reasons for why Jewish people should think we're not Jews. And this is especially the case for Jews who want to maintain intellectual consistency. If a Jew can deny the Torah as the word of God, not even try to observe kosher, or even deny the existence of God without controversy over their Jewish identity, why are Messianic Jews treated differently? The thinkers recognizing this double standard are reversing course. And so more examples of this Jewish-Jewish dialogue, recently a Messianic synagogue in Georgia called Tikvat David hosted Jewish scholar Dr. Mark Nanos, who's probably the most influential Paul within Judaism New Testament scholar today. And he gave a seminar on Paul, and it was really a fantastic event. He enjoyed his time there, and this took place within the Messianic synagogue, which is, which is really cool. And this year, Dr. Mark Nanos was supposed to be speaking at the UMJC conference until COVID-19 hit. But also, Dr. Amy Jill Levine, she, she spoke at the UMJC conference in 2018. So this is really cool how these New Testament Jewish scholars are coming and speaking at these Messianic conferences and even in a Messianic synagogue at Tikvat David. And this past November in 2019, Eric and I were at the Society of Biblical Literature Conference, which is a conference that's held annually that has thousands of biblical scholars and students that come to present papers. And during this conference, it, ha it was held, one of the days was over the weekend, and we had the great opportunity to go to a Messianic Shabbat dinner, and we were joined by not only Messianic Jewish scholars, but also non-Messianic Jewish scholars. And it was really amazing to have an opportunity to worship and fellowship together as a community. And there was just an energy in the room that I wish could be felt by all of us. And really the point that I'm trying to make here is that progress is being made. I also think we should keep in mind that the negative reaction in the Jewish community towards Messianic Jews mostly comes from the older generation. Millennial Jews today are more pluralistic in accepting of Messianic Jews. Recently, we made a post on our Instagram asking how Jewish people respond when they find out that you're Messianic, and one of the respondents was Balin Gad, and she said, all the ones I've told are college age, and they were curious or didn't know what it was, but were open. And I think this is really representative of, of how millennial Jews are responding to this. You see, self-identity today is key. And when Messianic Jews identify as Jews, millennials are more open, tolerant, and able to recognize our sincerity rather than assume we're trying to be deceptive. Those in the Jewish community who make an effort to understand us seem to not have this negative attitude evident in the many quotes that Eric and I went over. And this is true from my own experience. So while we shouldn't become dependent on marks of approval from other Jews, nor should acceptance be a primary goal, it is encouraging to hear that some non-Messianic Jewish people have taken the time to meet with us, speak with us, and genuinely consider who we are and how we fit into the wider Jewish community. So let's engage in productive dialogue with other Jews. And when we do, let's apply these two essential principles. Seek to understand before being understood, and state what you believe as precisely as possible. When we do this, I think we as Messianic Jews will be better understood, and healing will occur within our Jewish community. All right, so there you have it. Those were the Jewish perceptions of Messianic Jews. We would love to hear feedback from you. Please leave a comment regarding your thoughts on anything that we said in this video. We would love to hear from you. If you're on YouTube, please like, share, 
and subscribe and hit the notification bell to receive updates for new videos. If you're listening on podcasts, please hit subscribe to receive updates on whenever those are being newly posted. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you.